User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way! Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugetastic.com. Hi, it's Mike with Ugetastic. I'm here at RailsConf 2014 and I'm standing here with DHH, uh, David Hanemeyer Hansen. Uh, if you might know him, he's written a few books, done a few stuff. I think you have something to do with the product that we're here for the conference about. Uh, but we're, we're going to talk about his keynote that he just gave uh, about clarity and write, being a software writer. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for taking the time to, to talk with me. Sure. Um, so your keynote, what, what was the gist of, of, of what you were trying to communicate? Sure. So I think the um, identity of most programmers um, are coming from a an angle that doesn't fit the development of information technology very well mm -hmm. anymore. And that angle is software engineering. I think there's a lot of programmers who create information systems where engineering is actually not the primary mm -hmm. thing that they do. What they do is they write. They're software writers. They're trying to achieve a level of clarity, figuring out, first of all, what are they building? Mm -hmm. um, it's not like a bridge where you just know, well, it needs to go from there to work there, and we need to have this structural right. bearing, and so on and so forth. A lot of systems are very vaguely defined, right? Right. Um, so figuring out what you want to build is very much like figuring out what you want to say. Right. It's more yeah. elastic than just go from here to there. It and is. It is. And it's more fuzzy, over. and it's not as objective. It's <laughs> a much more subjective endeavor. Mm -hmm. And I find that uh, writing is much better metaphor than engineering. Mm -hmm. And within that, I, I find that one of the, the main ways that the people are driving their development right now is, uh, is TDD, Test Driven Development. And I've just, um, I used to be a big fan. And I used to be a big fan because it sounded like it made a lot of sense to me. Right. What I found over the years is that the test first approach, driving your design through the test, actually doesn't make that much sense uh, to me. And I found that a lot of other software that I looked at and discussed with people who uh, sort of that was created through the test first paradigm wasn't better. It was worse. And what's interesting though is it seems like Rails was very early on in, in the whole test driven development and, and putting that out there and even introducing it as a concept. But now 10 years later you're, you're feeling like you're backing away from that original. Yeah, so, so I think Rails was probably the first framework that just had tests by default. We had right. a place to put the tests, we generated them through the scaffolds per default. And I think there's still a lot of good to that. It's not that tests are bad. Mm -hmm. I think, I can't imagine building a modern application today without tests. If you yeah. don't have automated tests, you're really in the woods. Right. Um, but I don't find it as a, the primary objective of my design mm -hmm. discipline. Um, it's getting a little bit more nuanced than that. It, it's more nuanced than that, and, and mostly it's just test first works for me for mm -hmm. a tiny majority of the cases of what I do, and for a majority of the cases, test first, especially when focused on the unit mm -hmm. instead of the whole system, actually ends up creating more problems than it solves. Okay, and but like I was saying, it, it sounds like you've you've developed a more nuanced approach, and and it seems like some of the interactions with people in the community is a little bit more uh, dogmatic one way or the other. Either people are kind of taking a cheeky stance of, ah, test-driven development, that's silly. Uh, and then there's the other side, the, the Bob Martin camp, which is clean code. And you even kind of had a little little shot at the dirty code there uh, slide. But you know, listening to, the, to your, your conversation in person versus observing conversations online, it sounds like some of that meaning that nuance is, is gets lost sometimes. Sure, I mean, anything on Twitter is void of nuance. You have 140 characters. The only thing you can put out is absolutes. Yeah. Um, and they can be influential, influential in sort of starting the discussion and driving it. It won't get at all the nuance. You, you have to go deeper than just 140 characters, of course. Has the ping pong helped with that? Or is that I think the ping pong helped me um, crystallize my thoughts on it a bit. And the ping pong, uh, basically for people who don't know, was sort of people submitting a piece of code. Mm -hmm. um, I did that on and Hacker News a few times, and then yeah. there was some guy set up a site for it. Um, and we went over where this code could go. Mm -hmm. Like We agreed that the original piece of code was bad, mm -hmm. and then people would ping pong on it. Some people would then say, oh, well, the code is bad because it's in the pattern, or mm -hmm. it's not easily testable, or whatever. And I would try to go in a different direction where, where 
ever I applied this ping pong, it was about clarity. How can I make this code clearer, simpler, easier to understand, lower conceptual overhead, all these things, right? Um, and I found out I ended up in a very different spot, mm -hmm. right? So that's what partly helped me inform is that we are going in different directions. You end up somewhere else when you go through test first mm -hmm. than when you go through clarity first. Right. I don't want to call it that because there's I certainly don't want to have heard anything like clarity driven. Yeah. Right? That sounds ridiculous. Well, I talked to Dan North and it's the same kind of thing where they start with an idea and then it becomes dogma by other people who adopt it and then they yes. want to have that rigid. I think that's what the, I had a quote by Kent Beck that's mm -hmm. incredibly reasonable. It talks about sort of confidence levels in mm -hmm. your code. Um, more so than just talking about, well, every piece of code needs to be written with a test failing first. Mm -hmm. I think it's just not, I don't know if it's not realistic because I'm sure it's the, the, the real stuff for somebody is certainly not realistic for me. It's not the real for me, and it, it doesn't arrive at something better. I tried very hard and multiple times, um, and I didn't find that it took me to a good place. Yeah. And it, the one thing I see with the ping pong is at least it gives a concrete A and B yes. that can be talked about and reasoned about. And yes, before or after code is, is mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really a big fan of that because it crystallizes a lot of arguments that are otherwise very fluffy. Uh, it's very easy to talk about these things in the abstract. I think clarity, it's almost impossible to talk about it in the abstract because everybody agrees, yes, right. of course we should have clear code. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's not a controversial term, but when you apply it to an actual piece of code, then it can quite quickly can become controversial. Right. Okay, so you know, I wanted to uh, ask a few questions. Sure. Uh, some people have contributed uh, ideas for, for topics. And, yeah. uh, one of those was about just your experience releasing Rails as, as a major project and that it gets used by companies that make billions of dollars. Sure. Uh, but they don't always give back even a fraction of what they... Yeah. Uh, how, have, how have you uh, dealt with that? I mean, it, it doesn't sound like you're doing too shabby, but sure. not billions of dollars. Just, no, no, and I don't need to. And mm -hmm. it doesn't bother me at all, actually. There are a lot of people who do feel like, well, they're owed something because they contribute to open mm -hmm. source. I think that's an unfortunate perspective to have on what you're doing. If you're doing it for external reasons and external rewards, mm -hmm. that's not what I'm doing. It. I'm doing it for my own reward. Mm -hmm. um, a big part of my own reward is just that I enjoy it. Right. Uh, I'm not doing it for somebody else to sort of land me payday out of it. And I enjoy sharing it. And a side effect of sharing it freely and letting people use it like they want to, like I would want to use anything, is that some people can choose to use it to build great things that are of great value. And I don't see any of that value. That's yeah. okay. I mean, I. I think it's a, a, that's where open source, like I'm a big proponent of open source, but there's mm -hmm. also, there's a side of open source that I'm not that enthusiastic about. And mm -hmm. GPL, to some extent, is that side of it. I am not that enthusiastic about roping people into, you have to either donate code or mm -hmm. money or whatever, just because you use something. That doesn't appeal to me, especially on the code part. I, I don't want the code of somebody who doesn't want to give it. Mm -hmm. Like that's going to be, my perspective, probably not very good code. Right. Um, it's, it's so what? Like, I don't care if somebody extends it. If, if I need something in Rails I don't have already, I'll build it my damn self. Right. Um, and you know, actually, that since you brought up the, the, the GPL, uh, that, that was gonna cover another uh, question. Sure. But I do wanna ask about, so open, Rails is open source, and, and many of the libraries are that are used by it, well, all of the libraries that are used by it are also part of Rails or open source, sure. you know, omakase, uh, 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 selected gems. But Rails itself, that's a trademark. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't think about this just now, is that there, there, is a, there does seem to be a line between the codes out there and you can use it, but right. the brand itself. And has that helped keep Rails on the Rails? I think it, it helps keep Rails being this one thing. Mm -hmm. It's very easy di to dilute it. In the early days, we had a lot of people actually calling their frameworks in other languages Rails. Mm -hmm. And that's not a great thing. Like, I'm making Rails um, with a certain vision, mm -hmm. with a certain approach to it, and I want people to be able to know what that is. Right. I don't want people to pick something else up that says Rails, they think it's something that I made, and then it's some fucking PHP framework that I, right really wouldn't want to touch with a 10-foot pole, right? So I think trademarks are good in sort of removing confusion. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's what they're there for, right? right. They're there for just that, like, a certain company or a certain product, they can be that thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Coca-Cola can sell their cola, and it's called Coca-Cola, and somebody else can't sell their cola and call it Coca-Cola because mm -hmm. the consumer would get, get confused. I think there's great value in that. You can certainly go overboard, and people do that all the time, and some of that is unfortunately 
part of what trademark law is, that you have to sort of enforce it, otherwise you lose it. Um, That's tricky to keep that balance. It is, it is, it is. Turning people off. Yeah. Um, for me, the whole thing about keeping Rails as a trademark is just to avoiding that confusion. Mm -hmm. Not to avoiding people, like, I just, I don't want somebody to be representing, like, the official Rails mm -hmm. if it's not something that I believe in. Right. Because that's going to reflect poorly on me. Um, so that's the reason we have it. We haven't really used it for anything else. It doesn't, there's incredibly little economic value being yeah. derived from it. It's protecting what Rails is. And, uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, another question, uh, you know, we talked about the GPL, but what are your feelings about companies whose business practices you don't necessarily agree with, though, using sure. your product, using Rails? To me, it's like, I'm also paying my taxes, and those, some of those taxes go to paved roads, and some people who drive on those roads I don't agree with, so what? Like, it, it really doesn't matter. I can completely distinguish between uh, sort of the technical aspects of what somebody's mm -hmm. doing and then their um, otherwise business practices. So to me, there's, there's absolutely no sort of conflict in calling out companies who I think have poor business practices, mm -hmm. um, whether they're using Rails or not. Yeah, but I mean, when they come on, they say, oh, we're a Rails shop, and you're like, I wish you didn't say that, you know? Yeah, I, I, I don't. To me, I'm like, Rails is open source, it's mm -hmm. MIT, you can take it, you can do whatever you want with it. I'm not responsible for anybody who uses Rails, what they do with it, with the individual members of, of sort of the Rails community. I don't want that police role. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a hierarchy in, in that sense. It's right. not like somebody uses Rails as my employee and I have to be responsible for anything they say on behalf of Rails. Right. Just because somebody uses Rails doesn't mean that they're expressing thoughts on behalf of me. Mm -hmm. That's not how this is. That's explicitly why this is MIT, take and do whatever you want with it. I, no strings attached, right? Because then there's not that obligation for me to police um, everybody who uses it and how they use it or whether they're good people or they're bad people or whatever. It's just not, it's a separate thing and I don't want that as being part of the, what goes into Rails. Like it's enough sort of uh, on my shoulders just to run Rails as the vision of the framework it's right. on. If I also had to be responsible for anybody who chooses to use it and what they do, I fuck that. <laughs> okay. And uh, you know, the last one is a little bit more of a, a fun question and, and relative to the theme of, of Utastic, and that was during your keynote, even you mentioned going as a child to see, or a young man, young boy, uh, to see uh, you know, the gathering group yep. in, back in yep. Denmark. Right. Uh, but you're, just to go back in time to when you first were extracting rails from the frame, from base camp, if I'm. Yep. I, uh, I got nervous that I was going to sure. say the wrong thing. Uh, but when you were first extracting it, you wanted to show it to people, and you wanted to get people to to look at it and check it out, and you were going to user groups. What was the first other user group or conference you presented Rails, and what was the reception? Yeah, I think I actually first showed it off to some friends mm -hmm. who were working at uh, a couple of different companies, and I got like, oh yeah, that's, uh, that's sort of interesting, not a whole lot of uh, feedback to it, and then I showed it off at um, at a Danish university. Mm -hmm. And at the university itself, I don't know, I mean, yeah. 30 people or 40 people. Um, no, I'm like, yeah, people were interested, but yeah. it was like getting the video up that really yeah. made people interested in getting it out online. Just meeting with a local group of people didn't really do that much mm -hmm. in the beginning. Where I found like minded people were all over the internet. Yeah. Like, I posted a video and somebody was like, oh, they wrote me and like, oh, this is really interesting. I want to learn yeah. more about this. Uh, and that, at that time, I was also on the, the, the Ruby mailing list mm -hmm. and we were, I was, participating a fair amount in that, and we were talking on there, and uh, uh, IRC, I was using IRC, so for me it was always about the virtual mm -hmm. groups, not so much about meeting in person, even though that's great too, I mean, that's yeah. what we're doing here at RailsCon, 1500 people, it's great to do that occasionally, yeah. but the bulk of the sort of real work happens remotely, it happens right. for people just working for wherever they are, because the when you look at the, the Rails core group and the alumni group, they're from all over the place, right. like they're from all sorts of different countries and different cities and so forth, and uh, if I just had to run Rails just out of the programmers available in Copenhagen, I mean, yeah. no offense to the programmers of Copenhagen, but of course it wouldn't be as good, right. right? Like having the whole world work on something versus having one city in one tiny country work on something, right. not the same thing. And I, I remember that video coming out because oh, I, was, yeah. I was actually a Microsoft developer at the time and I didn't like it. Right. <laughs> but I, my, at that point in my life, my career options were limited. I just remember sure. seeing it going, that's cool, I want to work with that someday, now I do. So I'm yep, very happy awesome. that I appreciate uh, the creation and the work. And um, 
Uh, it's very nice. Um, uh, now, I, now, I, now I gushed and I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> but uh, no, again, I just want to thank you. I know you're busy. Sure. You have to go. Thank you very my much. My pleasure. For Absolutely. The time. Thank you for uh, putting this out there. Thanks. Love talking about it. All right. Thanks, everyone. User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com.